sight, O oh God, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Old Testament, we have God the Father speaking to the people, speaking to Abraham, speaking to Moses, speaking to the prophets. And we have written down a lot of those words that were spoken. And then in the Gospels, we have a lot of the teachings of Jesus written down all these words that Jesus has spoken. And then we get to the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and we don't really have a lot of words that the Holy Spirit has spoken. And next Sunday is Trinity Sunday. We'll talk more about the aspects and nuances of the Trinity. But this Sunday, when we look at Pentecost and we look specifically at the Holy Spirit coming down and indwelling the people of God, I also reflect on how we don't often talk about the Holy Spirit. We don't emphasize and focus on the Holy Spirit. I wonder if it's because we are a people of words and we don't have a lot of words from the Holy Spirit. In our great adult Sunday school class last Sunday, Rachel led us in the, in the spiritual writing and had two readings for us where it was two writers trying to reflect on their spiritual life while going through something very painful and difficult. And both of them ended up kind of coming around to this idea of anguish and sorrow and, and the feelings that are beyond words. And even what, whenever we give words and name things, we kind of give it definition and limits and like a, like a cage a little bit. And even saying I was in sorrow beyond words is kind of limiting as well. It's descriptive, but it's limiting. And I found in life that there are some highs and there are some lows where when, when you're in the midst of it, the feeling is beyond words. And even the Holy Spirit, the word that we translate spirit in Greek is pneuma, spelled P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma, where we get like pneumatology, pneumonia, it's kind of the word for lungs. And, and the Greek word is often translated as breath, wind, life, or spirit. And so today we commemorate that moment where the holy breath of God descended on the people of God in bold and powerful ways, in ways that are unspoken and words cannot fully express and articulate. And in, in the gospel today, we have Jesus preaching lots of words, and he says, I have to leave you, and I'm not coming back, and I'm coming back in a long time, and you seem really sad that I'm leaving you, but you shouldn't be sad, because unless I leave, the holy breath of God will not come. And he's kind of implying that it's better that I leave, because it's better for you to have the holy breath of God with you than to have Jesus. And so today we see that holy breath coming in a bold and powerful way in the book of Acts. And one thing for us, I think, to remember when we read this story is in our time, St. Peter is very revered, right? The Pope is in the line of St. Peter. He's like today's version of St. Peter. And he has St. Peter's Square. And it's this beautiful marble place with all kinds of ornate statues everywhere. And it's gigantic impressive, very expensive. And when you go there, you're filled with awe and wonder. And you're also like, this is a person who's in a seat of power. This is a powerful person that, that resides here. And St. Peter's Basilica is gigantic. It's ornate. It's named after St. Peter. Apparently the inside is lined with a lot of gold. And as an aside, a lot of that gold was mined in North, what, what is now North America by Spanish uh, conquistadors that enslaved and abused and murdered lots of the indigenous people in order to harvest the gold that could go back and decorate St. Peter's Basilica. And so for us, when we read this passage, we, we have this lens of St. Peter as being this important and powerful person. It's like, oh, wow, St. Peter. But in this time and in this context, Peter was a blue collar, not very well educated fisherman from Nazareth, which in the, in the gospels, they tend to look down on it like it's some hick backwoods place that no one important would ever come from. And a lot of the disciples seem to be more blue collar, not very well educated people 
from places outside of the important places, as we call them. And so here they are coming to Jerusalem and to the temple, the seats of power, the seats of importance, the capital city. And they come on a feast day, Pentecost. And there are people gathered from all over the Jewish diaspora. Um, and, and 600 years earlier, the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem, destroyed it, destroyed the temple, and ruined it and carted everyone off into exile. And ever since, from then until a long time, the different empires had been conquered and occupying Israel. And so in the time Peter gets up, you have uh, people of Israel who had moved on and moved to different places to make their life somewhere else. And in those different places, they all had particular culture, particular language, style of dress, and they'd all kind of learn different things. And they all bring that back to Jerusalem. And Joseph did a great job this morning. This is, if you're a reader, this was one of those passages where you're not necessarily excited to be assigned because you have all these names you have to read. But it, I, it highlights the beauty of the diverse diaspora that had regathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And I imagine that in Jerusalem and in the temple, the people maybe were a little snobbish. They're like, well, we're the chosen people of God who chose to stay here. We're the chosen people of God who remained in Jerusalem and we worship at the temple. So we're important. And I can imagine when all those people in their particular cultures return, it was assumed that they would speak Hebrew. And I assume a particular dialect of Hebrew that was spoken in Jerusalem at that time. And I wonder if the people knowing they were traveling back to Jerusalem spent a couple weeks trying to brush up on their Hebrew so that they could fit in, so that they could be accepted, so that they could uh, adhere to the guidelines of the people in power. And instead, they all show up, and Peter, again, this humble, uneducated fisherman, gets up and preaches with, inspired by the breath of the holy breath of God. And everyone hears the language of God spoken in their particular context. And I read this great quote that says, Pentecost is the sound of excluded voices making something whole again. And what's happening in Pentecost, when Peter preaches the love of God and the story of Jesus, all the people are allowed to stay in their particular identity and to bring that to the temple. Previously, it was like, well, you can come, but you got to fit in and speak our language. And in Pentecost, you can bring your own language. You can bring your own identity. And so Peter filled with the breath, the holy breath of God, is speaking to the Parthians, the Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and residents of Judea, and Cappadocians, and to apply it today, and Black Americans, and Black Caribbean people living in America, and Latinx people and Asian people and white people and LGBTQ people and men and women and gender nonconforming people and orphans and people who grew up in healthy families and people who grew up in very dysfunctional families and people with big homes up in the Oakland Hills, and our houseless neighbors living under the bridge down the street, and everyone in their particular identity brings that to the family of God, and we don't diminish that, but we lift it up, and in Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and makes whole this thing that was that it intentionally been structured to exclude people. So on this Pentecost, we all wear red, but we bring our own particular identity and all of it is lifted up and valued and I dare say needed in our church to be the body of Christ. All those particular identities come 
And they're not diminished in order to make us one, but they're brought in their wholeness in order to make us all one. And that is the key moment of Pentecost. And it doesn't come in words. It doesn't come in this clearly defined, wealth, well uh, articulated, uh, systematic theology. Instead, it comes as the holy breath of God. And it says it descended like fire, which again is using words to try and explain something that is just so beyond words that it's hard to really fathom. And so in this next week, as we celebrate Pentecost and the week after Pentecost, I urge us all to kind of sit with the holy breath of God and be still. And as we, you know, if you're going through a rough time and you're kind of down here and you kind of say, God, where are you? God, I'm suffering. God, what's going on? We often want to hear words in response. We want to hear words that'll make it well. But what does it mean that the holy breath of God will come wordless? And maybe that is what we need. And maybe that will make it well. And maybe that will be the sound of excluded voices making something whole again. Amen.